you know, I, I know you have a vast experience, but obviously one of the things that struck the public here this time was the first live robotics case. Uh, do you want to tell us a little about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that uh, we were able to do two live robotic cases this year. This is a field and a passion that we have been driving since two, three years ago. We did a lot of research, we did a lot of validation and work with Corindus, that's now the Siemens company. We, we did the first in-human case and the first series of uh, aneurysm treatments done robotically back in 2019. And we have now, with those cases we presented today, close to 30 cases uh, treated uh, robotically. And we are very impressed by the technology, by the precision, by all the different features, including radiation protection, including uh, uh, the improvement of the workflow of the procedure that I, I see as, as the future. And I'm happy to be able to, to actually show to a bigger audience in a live situation that they can really see how things work in the real life on the robotic procedure. And I, I flew from Toronto this morning and the feedback that I've, I've been having is, is great and I'm happy and proud to be able to have this experience here at the link. I noticed that when, when you were presenting the case, there was some concern or, or questions asked in the audience about how it felt not to have the, the feel, the touch that you're used to. And you explained that you, didn't realize, you don't realize how much depends on imagery, but also that you did have another, another kind of touch. Do you want to talk to that? Yeah, the, the, we, have, we, we are in a field that we, we are very manual. We are used to feel what we are doing but I think we actually base more our decisions on what we see than what we feel. And I, I, I've been, for the last 15 years, working in, in academia, in busy training centers that we are always coaching and teaching fellows. Mm -hmm. And instead of feeling, I see the imaging and I react to them telling my fellows what to do. And during a robotic procedure, I'm in a comfortable position, I have a high definition screen in front of me, and I, I'm not telling someone what to do. I'm actually using a robot to precisely perform what I think it should be done. And it, it's a very comfortable situation. During the procedure itself, I don't feel a need for a haptic feedback. Sometimes on the navigation, when you don't know where your tip of your catheter is, you may need something like that, but I think we underestimate how much we use imaging. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's my conclusion after those, those cases and my robotic ex experience now. now I, I interviewed Ricardo Hanel this morning and he was talking about how he thought also what you're doing is interesting because people say it slows things down, but he said that that could be a very good thing because Today, perhaps, we, we go too quickly into these interventions, and by doing things step by step with the robot, you actually return to a, you actually have another approach that could be very positive. Yeah, it, it doesn't slow you down if you have experience, if you have a team that know how to set mm -hmm. up things, but it gives you the control. So, uh, I was talking on my, on one of the lectures that I give today, about precision and sometimes we think that we are precise but we are not ne necessarily as precise as we, as we think. Mm -hmm. We have data from surgery that actually prospectively if someone watch a surgery, another surgeon watch a surgery, he will find a lot of things that the adverse events that actually the, true, the surgeon that was performing the procedure didn't pick. So I think the concept of precision that doing manually is better, it's probably not mm -hmm. as accurate because we don't have data in neuroradiology to, to understand how precise we are, how many years of experience, what is the volume that you need to actually perform a procedure very well. And I think the robotic uh, can give us the confidence and can give us a level of real, real reliability that is very high and 
it will not slow you down. It gives you the control of the procedure. It sort of installs another kind of discipline in the way you, you work, I would imagine. Yeah. You, have, you work in a precise order, yeah. and then you have a precise re response from the machine. Completely, completely, because you watch every step, every curve you will do. I will give you an example. So on the robot, we have a console with three joysticks. So I'm moving a wire, I move it forward, and if there is a curve, I press a button, it turns. If it doesn't turn to the right way, I press another button, it will turn another time, and then I push a joystick. If I'm doing it manually, I have a torque, and I will torque once. It doesn't work, I torque twice. I torque another time, I torque another time. If you think how many movements we do manually to accomplish a task, it's way more than I do robotically, and I do, we do sometimes uh, faster, and it's not precise, but this is the way we are used to. This is also a big uh, paradigm that we have to overcome as in specialty to be able to move towards something more precise, more controlled, that you have to adapt your style to that new technology. I mean, I think that's a history of technology too, that it becomes an extension of us. And it, it's not something that takes over from us, but, be, but become, like the, the hand, it's not going to do something that you couldn't do. You have to know what you're doing to control the robot. Completely. And so it becomes an extension in a positive way of what, what you already that's, know. Yeah, that's a very good summary. This is a system that it facilitates the surgery. So it's a completely master-slave system. So the, the robot is helping you performing a task. And this is the way that we should see. So the robot is helping me navigate in the catheter, but you have full control. Right. It's a, almost a one-to-one -one system with a very fast delay in response. There's a lot of alarms to control the tension and the resistance. So it's a system that is an extension. And that, that, that reflects your experience. So it's not going to, it, it's not a button you push and it does the intervention. No, no, no. It's mm. not, there are some automated functions for example, some rotations, uh, the robot can pin the wire and you can advance the catheter, something that we usually would do in four hands. Mm -hmm. With the robot, you can do it with one hand. Mm -hmm. so, so you have functions that the robot brings, but it all depends fully on the operator to command, to actuate. I, I, I imagine now at this stage, you're still in a, you still have a strict patient selection on the kind of cases you do. Or is it rather open? Every patient that I think will benefit from the precision of the robot, I try to include in the study. So mm -hmm. we are enrolling patients into the core path mm -hmm. neuro study. It's a study that Siemens and Corindus are promoting to demonstrate the safety and feasibility of the study. And uh, yeah, every patient that I, 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 it will fit the criteria, we try to enroll consecutively every patient. Now, I remember many years ago I interviewed you and you were about to do a, you were working on a transmission to do an intervention at a distance. I think it was with Calgary or perhaps I don't remember. And that, it seems to me that, that the robot, not now, but in the future can facilitate that kind of... That's probably the main, uh, one of the main aims. So, because now already this generation can offer precise radiation protection to the team can offer ergonomy, but what will be transformative to the field is to improve the access to stroke care, aneurysm care, to remote communities. Mm -hmm. There are places that are just not accessible because it's geographically distant. And even with transportation times, the, the, it, it will, the patients will, will not be able to be treated. And the only way for you to get access to uh, care to those patients is with remote robotic surgeon. I think this will be huge. To give you an example, in Canada, uh, as we, we have a pretty good healthcare system, particularly for acute treatment, and we only have about 10-15% of the population that will have access to acute care for stroke. 85% yeah. will have no access in a timely fashion. So they will depend on the transportation, mm -hmm. they will depend on the availability of the services, 
and if weather conditions are not a con uh, ideal or optimal, they will depend on that as well. So this we have a large number of patients, United States, China, Russia, big surface, some places here in Europe, you will have no access to care. And, and, and the interesting thing, the one positive thing of the pandemic, among other things perhaps, is people are now used, the patient, telemedicine, to technology. What might have been reticent three years ago now is accepted as common. It's a good point. I agree with you. Telemedicine, it's, it's getting widely for consultations, mm -hmm. for second opinion, but a surgery, it's still no, a step No, but it's ahead. a step. It's still a step I agree, in people's fully agree. minds. And I think I, I'm happy and I agree with you. Even for conferences, we have this conference that is the biggest conference in our specialty, half presential, half mm -hmm. live. Mm -hmm. So we had to adapt. We, we, we have been living yeah. completely different and unexpected times. And I think we, we've done for, despite of the, 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 the COVID times, pretty well in terms of connectivity, access and, and remoteness. But the procedures will, will need a step of further, but yeah, we are setting good, good grounds. Well, thank you for speaking with us today. My pleasure.